Stephen Ruggles was born in 1955, <laughs> the child of middle-class parents, a sad condition that blighted the lives of too many of his contemporaries. The haunted look says more than words that can convey. The family was crammed into a tiny cottage with few amenities beyond modern plumbing and an elevator. Steve's sole escape was into the grim landscape of Yale University campus. These manicured lawns were his only playground. But even more daunting than the physical deprivation, both of Steve's parents were, and I don't think there's any way to sugarcoat this, economists. <laughs> Not a pretty picture. What are the chances that a successful academic could arise from such an intellectual wasteland? <laughs> Consider, perhaps, Steve's greatest contribution to the profession, the Integrated Public Use Microdata Series. Where could Steve ever have conceived of the themes that would define his spectacular career? <laughs> Surely, true genius has no antecedents. <laughs> Given the obstacles, Steve had to grow up fast. At his high school graduation, through this adolescent peach fuzz, you can already see hints of the man he would become. Legal counsel has advised me to skip over the college years, so we're going to move right along. After getting his PhD from Penn, Steve had a slew of job offers. Well, a job offer from the University of Minnesota, where he was unfazed at the prospect of being forever associated with a hapless rodent. In 1985, Steve arrived at Minnesota, a fresh-faced history professor, ready to change the world, or at least to describe it within reasonable confidence intervals. But his cookie-cutter career took a turn towards strange new places when he landed his first big grant, a sample of the 1880 U.S. Census. For a historian, it was like discovering a hitherto unknown manuscript, one that, upon translation, spells out the word tenure. <laughs> Compared with what was to come, these were humble beginnings. The grad students huddled at one computer, sharing a single coffee cup. <laughs> and the work was hard, but the team played hard, too. So how did Steve instill such a spree de corps? Well, it's all about respect. <laughs> Bring him a beer or a pack of smokes, and you are practically guaranteed a pat on the head and a hearty, that's a good boy. <laughs> that's the kind of leadership they don't teach in the Wharton School. After the 1880 census came 1850, then 1860, and 1870. They were done out of order because, well, Steve's actually not all that great at the whole history thing. <laughs> then, in the mid-1990s came the big franchise, the Ipums. From the early days, Ipums adopted the motto, use it for good, never for evil, which should be slowly appearing. <laughs> but early users may have noticed the brief flirtation with some other alternative slogans. <laughs> and there was the losing campaign to get people to stop calling it iPums, <laughs> which actually does make more sense. So Steve's empire grew steadily over the years, from a few dedicated stalwarts to veritable legions. <laughs> Ultimately, all this growth led to the founding of the Minnesota Population Center in 2000. Steve finally had the underground bunker coveted by all mad scientists. <laughs> Fortunately, his ability to craft a good denominator is not a significant threat to public safety. In the course of his many achievements, Steve was made a Regents Professor, received the Lapham Award and a couple of book awards, and wrote dozens of articles, some of them pretty good. He's been principal investigator on more than 40 major NIH and NSF grants and has been directly instrumental in the release to the research community of over a billion person records over the last 25 years. More importantly, Steve was featured in an article in Wired Magazine 
which proclaimed him the king of quant. <laughs> On the other hand, it also likened him to Santa's <laughs> dark twin. More recently, Wonk Blog <laughs> declared Steve a, quote, certified data wizard. It says so right here on his CV, next to some other obscure honors. <laughs> some people will tell you that the success went to Steve's head. And maybe there's a grain of truth to that. There were the years that he wore that award around his neck all the time, even refusing to shake hands with high-level administrators <laughs> If, if they weren't already IPMS users. And there were the experimental lifestyles that are best left forgotten. But despite, despite the occasional bumps in the road and the power mad episodes, we always knew that Steve was at heart a man of the people and he never lost touch with his core beliefs. I'll conclude with a true fact. Back in around 1990, long before the days of social media, the server system at Minnesota had a feature allowing anyone with an account to register their plan. Few people did this, and, and even fewer back in the day noticed Steve's plan, which was to revolutionize the study of historical demography. Not bad, Steve. So that ends our story, and without further ado, this year's PIA president, Steve Ruggles. Thank you, Matt, for that very kind introduction. <laughs> I'm also grateful to all the people who work so hard to make this meeting happen, the largest uh, meeting in the 80-year history of the Population Association of America. Uh, Robert Moffitt uh, explained what I had to do in great detail. Danielle Stout picked up the executive director job in midstream and has produced a smoothly functioning meeting. My program co-chair, Lynn Casper, uh, and her poster committee at USC uh, uh, did a terrific job. Herman and, Rodrig uh, and Irene Rodriguez expertly handled the mechanics of creating the program, probably for the last time. And the extraordinary planning committee of Kathy Fitch, Devin Christensen, and Gina Ramore invested countless hours making sure all the pieces work together. The unique strength of PAA is the decentralized process for planning the program. We had 52 members of the program committee. They decided on what sessions to offer, and more importantly, they recruited the 172 organizers, session organizers, who actually did the work. And I, I, my sincere thanks to all of these people. A lot of people have also helped me with my presidential address. For the last year and a half, I've been presenting pieces of it around the country and also in Peru and Brazil. And every single time I got feedback that affected my thinking and made me rethink uh, how I was doing things. There's a few people who were especially helpful. Fran Goldscheider, Stephanie Kuntz, my Minnesota colleagues, Kathy Fitch, Katie Genetic, Miriam King, Devin Christensen, Ann Meyer, Phyllis Moen, Gina Ramori, and Matt Sobeck, and my spouse, Lisa Norling. The most important contributors to my research are the world's greatest team, of data creators, curators, integrators, and disseminators. Without the incredible data science team of the Minnesota Population Center, we wouldn't know what happened in the American past. I'm gonna show you a lot of numbers tonight, and almost all of them come from IPMs. The MPC data wizards are not resting on their laurels. The amazing new big data are on the way on an unprecedented scale. And at nine tonight, we're having a party in honor of the MPC data team. So if you use MPC data, 
or you just want to learn about the cool new data that are coming soon, or you just want to drink in some jazz, uh, come to our party on the terrace across the hall at 9 and talk data to us. <laughs> American families have seen seismic changes over the last two centuries. It began with the decline of intergenerational co-residence starting after 1850. Between 1850 and 1990, the percentage of elderly residing in multi-generational families dropped from 73% to 16%. Soon afterwards, divorce rates began to rise. Except for a temporary spike after World War II, divorce has increased almost continuously for 150 years. Once we control for age composition, new data show that the divorce rate leveled off only briefly in, in the early 1980s and has continued going up rapidly since then. Since 1960, marriage has begun to retreat. This is the percentage of women who didn't marry by age 40 to 44 by year of birth. It looks like a third of young adults will never get married. The trend shows no signs of slowing down. This is unprecedented. Among all previous cohorts, at least 90% of women got married. As marriage has declined, unmarried fertility has increased. Today, over 40% of newborns have unmarried mothers. Today, I'm going to argue that more than anything else, these changes reflect long-run changes in work. I'm going to start by describing the transformation of the economic organization of families and the implications of economic change for gender and generational relations. I'll assess the impact on the family of the rise of male wage labor. I'm going to describe the character of the male breadwinner family in the mid-20th century and discuss the causes and consequences of women's employment in wage labor. In the second part of the talk, I'm going to discuss the effects of the decline in wage labor opportunities for young adults that has occurred during the past four decades. I'm going to present new estimates of the changes in the relative income of young men. I'm going to assess the consequences of those changes uh, for families. And then I'm going to look at the various explanations for the decline of opportunity, and I will conclude with some speculations on the impact of technological change on the future of work and family. For most of the 19th century, production was carried out by families. In 1800, three quarters of the workforce was engaged in agricultural work. A majority of the population lived on farms until 1850. All family members who were old enough to do so contributed to farm production. Farms couldn't operate without family labor. Among the quarter of the population that didn't work on farms, most still made their living through the family economy. Most non-farm production was carried out by family businesses. Among the most common occupations were shoemakers, merchants, tailors, physicians, butchers, grocers, bakers, tavern keepers. In most of these businesses, the family resided on the same premises as the shop. The whole family worked in the businesses. Like farms, these kinds of businesses were handed down from generation to generation. This graph, which I have shamelessly stolen from Frank Goldscheider, uh, describes the economic basis of married couple households. The corporate family economy category includes all families with self-employed married men, except those in which wives had an occupation outside the family business. Most of these corporate families, of course, were farm families. In addition to kin, corporate families uh, often included farmhands, servants, and slaves, and sometimes apprentices. 
So corporate families remained in the majority throughout the 19th century. They remained important through the first half of the 20th century. They were the basis of society for hundreds, maybe thousands of years. Corporate families were organized according to patriarchal tradition. The master of the household had the legal right to command the obedience of his wife and children to use corporal punishment to correct insubordination. In most states, husbands owned the value of their wives' labor as well as most property that women brought into marriage. Under this patriarchal system, the head of household owned and controlled the means of production. Wives and children were obliged to provide the unpaid labor needed to sustain the family enterprise. Male breadwinner families are those in which the husband worked outside the home and the wife doesn't have any occupation listed. The male breadwinner category represented a majority of marriages for just four decades. From 1920 to 1960, they reached a peak of 57% in 1940. Shortly after the turn of the 20th century, the number of married women working outside their families began to increase. The pace of change accelerated in the middle decades of the century. Dual earner families have now predominated for the last past, past half century. And then uh, in, in, in the orange up in the top, you can see that female breadwinner families have emerged as a significant new form, and they now account for about a tenth of marriages. The reason the corporate family predominated in the 19th century is that before the Industrial Revolution, people didn't have many other options. The percent of the male labor force engaged in agriculture dropped from 75% in 1800 to about 1% in 2010. This massive transformation had profound consequences for the family. The growth of well-paid, non-agricultural wage labor jobs for men undermined the underpinnings of patriarchal authority. As young men took jobs off the farm, they moved away from the home and outside of the control of the patriarch. Compare the percentage of men in agriculture with the percentage of elderly residing in multi-generational families. The decline of the multi-generational family occurred mainly because of increasing opportunities for the young and declining parental control over children. In all periods, the likelihood of intergenerational co-residence has depended much more on the economic circumstances of the younger generation than on the circumstances of the older generation. The decline of intergenerational co-residence made sense both from the perspective of the younger generation and from the perspective of the older generation. With the transformation of the economy, the older generation no longer needed the labor that their sons and daughters once provided, and the patriarch could no longer offer the younger generation employment and eventual inheritance of the family farm or business. The earliest we can see the full occupational distribution is 1850, when the transformation of the economy was already well underway. But wage labor jobs that paid enough to support a family were still scarce in 1850. About two thirds of men were either self-employed, usually as farmers or sons of farmers or slaves on farms. Another 15% were unskilled workers who were mostly farmhands, wage laborers who were paid mostly in the form of room and board. They usually didn't get paid enough to get married. In 1850, the biggest groups of skilled workers shown in the light blue were, were uh, um, uh, miners and sailors. They were paid a lot better than the farm laborers, but they worked in places where there weren't a lot of women available to marry. So if a young man wanted to marry, his best prospect was still to inherit the family farm or business. And in most families, at least one child remained in the parental household 
under the control of the patriarch. But as the century progressed, new, highly paid opportunities arose in factories. The number of factory jobs rose 600 percent between 1850 and 1900. There were rapidly expanding opportunities in clerical, sales, and professional occupations. When young men could obtain well-played employment for wages, they no longer had incentives to remain at home under the control of their fathers. One key consequence of the rise of well-paid male wage labor jobs was a long-run decline in marriage age, especially among men. Under the corporate family system, young men had to wait until they either inherited a farm or built enough, uh, enough resources up to establish a new household of their own. Under the wage labor system, men could achieve high earnings comparatively earn early in life. And so as jobs paying good wages for men began to open up in the late 19th and early 20th century, they could increasingly afford to marry at an earlier age. So between 1890 and 1960, age at first marriage dropped 3.6 years among men and 2.2 years among women. And I believe that this reflects the increase in, in male wage labor opportunities. Looking back at the family systems graph, we can see that by 1920, the number of male breadwinner families exceeded the number of corporate families. The percentage continued to grow until World War II. This change was driven by the expanding wage labor opportunities for men. The rise of the male breadwinner family may have empowered young men, but it didn't do much for women. Despite the nostalgia for Ozzie and Harriet, when it comes to gender relations, the mid-20th century is a strange and frightening place. First wave feminists obtained the vote in 1920, but in most respects, patriarchal family norms remained firmly entrenched. In the mid-20th century, women still couldn't get a bank account or a loan without their husband's signature. The husband had the right to determine where the family lived, and patriarchal authority was still enforced through violence. In the 1950s, wife beating was considered funny. In the funnies of the 1950s, Andy Capp beat up his flow, wife Flo virtually every day. It wasn't until the late 1960s that Flo finally started fighting back. On the honeymooners, Ralph threatened to punch Alice almost every episode. Here's an ad for coffee. Here's a column by Artie Adela in the New York Mirror. This was the second biggest circulation newspaper in the United States. These are real men in the, in the street interviews answering the question, if a woman needs it, should she be spanked? If they don't know how to behave by the time they're adults, they should be treated like children and spanked. As a barber, I have a lot of faith in the hairbrush. You bet, it teaches them who's boss. A lot of women tend to forget this is a man's world. Most of them have it coming to them anyway. If they don't, it will remind them how well off they are. An ounce of prevention is worth a pound of cure. The male breadwinner family ended with the rise of wage labor jobs for women. Here's the long run pattern of women's occupations. As we've seen, wage labor opportunities for men were extremely limited for men in the middle of the 19th century. The opportunities for women in that period were virtually non-existent. In 1850, the great majority of working women were unpaid workers in family enterprises, mostly farm wives and daughters and slaves. The dark blue band, the unskilled workers, was entirely consisted of domestic servants in 1850. The best jobs available for women were the 1.3% of factory workers. The tiny professional and managerial category accounting for less than 1% of adult women in the mid 19th century consisted entirely of teachers. The growth of better paid jobs for women began around 1900 and expanded rapidly after World War II. So the overall pattern 
of women's employment is U-shaped, with the low point of the U being the peak of the male breadwinner family. Things changed quickly when wives started working. These are the percentage working among women aged 25 to 29, old enough so that few were still in school, but young enough that they were still of marrying age. So as shown by the light blue line, single women of that age were mostly working by 1920. The expansion of wage labor opportunities for women allowed some women to escape from bad marriages. From 1880 to 1990, the places that had jobs for women were also the places with the highest divorce rates. The percent of young married women grew gradually, uh, uh, um, who were working grew gradually from 1900 until 1962, and then it took off. Before the 1950s, women generally left wage labor employment when they got married. They had to do this. Employers barred married women from working for more ages. So for some married women, emergency work experience during World War II increased the likelihood of employment after the war. But the main reason for the sharp rise of married women's employment after the war was unprecedented demand for labor, which created pressures to overcome the institutional barriers to change. The economy heated up just as the marriage boom eliminated the, eliminated the supply of single women. So the rules against hiring married women simply evaporated. There was a massive shift in attitudes towards married women's work. The evidence on the timing of change suggests that this shift Re uh, reflected an accommodation to the new structural realities. This figure compares the percentage of married women who are in the labor force, that's the blue line, with the percentage of married women who disagreed with the idea that women should stay home, that's the orange line. So in 1970, that's the first year of the attitudinal survey, 44% of wives were already in the workforce. But fewer than 20% of married wives thought that women should work outside of the home. If we just look at the attitudes of the working wives, it turns out that 70% of them in 1970 thought that it would be much better for everyone involved if the man is the achiever and the women takes care of the home and family. So the great majority of working wives in 1970 felt that women work, that wives ought to stay at home. So this doubtless led to some cognitive dissonance that conflict between attitudes and behavior was soon resolved. As married women flooded into the paid workforce, the stigma that had surrounded married women's participation in wage labor quickly disappeared. And by 1980, most married women approved of married women's work. New employment opportunity was not the only structural change that empowered women. Women also gained control over reproduction. IUDs became available in the late 1950s. The pill was approved for contraceptive use in 1960, and abortion became become widely available in the late 1960s. Supreme Court decisions in 1972 and 1973 led to universal availability of contraception and abortion to all women in all states. There's strong evidence that contraception and abortion reduce the proportion of marriages resulting from unplanned pregnancies, and that in turn contributed to delayed marriage and childbearing, increased educational attainment among women, and increased female labor force participation. Just as attitudes towards work shifted to accommodate the new realities, so did attitudes towards sex. In 1969, 75% of survey respondents said that premarital sex was wrong. By 1982, only 38% of respondents agreed. The rapid and dramatic shift in gender norms and the decline of patriarchy were reflected on the U.S. Census form. In 1970, 
patriarchy was embedded in the census. The census asked each respondent to identify the household head, just as it had for the previous 18 census years. The household head was always the man. The spouse of the head was always the wife, never the husband. By 1980, the household head was gone, replaced by the gender-neutral householder concept. Either husband or wife could be listed as the householder, and either could be listed as the spouse of the householder. The massive transformation of the family in the 20th century could never have occurred without profound changes in attitudes. Changing attitudes are a crucial part of the process of family change. There's a feedback loop. As family attitudes shifted, they stimulated more family change. So as divorce became more common, for example, it lost a lot of its stigma, and that contributed to more divorce. But we have no reason to think that patriarchal family norms, which had predominated for thousands of years, would have collapsed without the economic transformations of the Industrial Revolution. Norms are inherently conservative. For family change and attitudinal change to occur, traditional values had to be overcome. So norms are a barrier to change, not a cause of change. There, there has to be some sort of pressure to get people to reject the values that they were raised with. And I think that that pressure was exerted mainly by the rise of wage labor, first among men, then among women. The rise of wage labor undercut the economic control of the patriarch. It shifted power from old to young, from men to women. The structural changes broke the hold of patriarchal authority and stimulated the massive attitudinal shifts of the past century. Structural change preceded attitudinal change. The decline in multi-generational families occurred after the decline of wage labor for men. The shift in attitudes about women's work occurred after the shift in women's work. The shift in attitudes about sexuality occurred after the introduction of new methods of fertility control for women. This model I've been showing you of the shifting family economies focuses on married couple households. But during the past 40 years, marriage has declined dramatically. More and more young people are either cohabiting or living with a partner uh, or, or living without a partner at all. So in recent decades, this representation simply misses a whole lot of families. Structural fa factors are responsible for the boom and bust of marriage over the past 100 years. As Valerie Oppenheimer argued forcefully, family change has always been much more closely associated with male wages than with female wages, as far back as we can measure. The post-war marriage boom was fueled by the rapid expansion of men's wages, and the decline in men's wages since 1975 is the main reason for the retreat from marriage in that period. Here are the, full, the median wages for 25 to 29-year-old full-time employed men and women in 2013 dollars um, uh, for the last uh, half century. The three decades uh, after World War II were a golden age of wage labor for young men. The availability of labor was sharply constrained because immigration had been restricted since 1924. Fertility levels during the Depression were the lowest that had ever been recorded. And so the new cohorts entering the labor force were small. As Woody Carlson expressed it, the lucky few entering the labor force after the war saw this spectacular rise in wages. Median income for full-time employed young men rose threefold in the post-war era, era to a peak of $53,000 in 1974. Since that peak, young men's wages have declined about 30% from $53,000 in 1974 to 38,000 in 2013. Wages for full-time working women after the war went up too, but not as rapidly, and women's wages have stagnated since the mid-1970s. 
Now, the previous graph uh, focused on median wages uh, for full-time workers. This one includes the entire population, and the changes are even more dramatic. And the reason for this is that more and more men aren't working full-time, and a growing percentage of them aren't working at all. So if, as a result, if we look at all men, wages actually declined 47% from a peak of $45,000 in 1974 to just $24,000 in 2013. So this is an extraordinary and unprecedented change. Young men's wages have fallen almost by half over a 40-year period. This makes the Great Depression look like a cakewalk. In the 1930s, Wages declined just for a few years before they started heading back up. Nothing like this has occurred at any time during the past two centuries. The sharp decline of young men's wages provided additional incentives for married women to enter the workforce. For a lot of couples, two, uh, two incomes were essential for economic survival. Richard Easterlin argued that the salient threshold in marriage decisions is not the absolute level of income, but um, actually relative income. Relative income defined as the income of young men relative to the expectations that they formed in their parental home as they were growing up. So here's a simple measure of relative income. This is the income of young men, age 25 to 29, relative to the income of men the same age a generation earlier. So it's the median income of men, age 25 to 29, as a percentage of the same age group a quarter century earlier when their fathers were about the same age. So the horizontal line at 100 shows the point at which the younger and the older generations made about the same amount. So in 1960, young men were making almost four times what their fathers had made at the same age. For the past three decades, the younger generation has consistently done worse than their fathers did at the same age. This is a precipitous decline. Overall, generational relative income has dropped a stunning 80% since its peak in 1958. We can also assess relative income by comparing current income to a social ideal based on the income of the affluent. This graph compares the median income of young men to the average income of the top 1% of the population. This measure peaked in 1970, when 25 to 29-year-old men were making about 13% as much as the average income of the top 1%. By 2012, this was down to just 2.6%. So these measures of relative income fit the timing of the marriage boom pretty well. From the 1950s to the 1970s, when young men were doing terrifically well with respect to relative income, marriage age was exceptionally young. And for the past half century, marriage age has been rising at an unprecedented pace. How much of the family change since 1960 can be explained by the drop in relative income? So to try to answer this question, I did a Das Gupta style de decomposition analysis. Here's my dependent variable, the percent of 25 to 29 year old men who are currently married with spouse present between 1960 and 2013. This measure went from about 73% married spouse present in 1960 to about 23% in, in 2013. So that's a spectacular decline of 50 percentage points over those uh, 50 years. This dramatic change reflects the rise, mostly the rise of marriage age, but it's also affected by the rise of divorce, separation, non-marriage, and cohabitation. So here are the results. The decomposition shows how much of the change would disappear if the economic composition of the young adult population hadn't changed over that period. So this is the total page change, about 50 percentage points, 73 to 23. In the right column, we express this as a, uh, affects as a percentage of the total case change. 
The first factor, relative income, that's the big one. This is the, just the income of the 25 to 29 year olds divided by the median income of the people the same age a generation earlier. If that distribution is held constant over time, almost 45% of the change disappears. I also put in a few other variables like broad occupation category, unemployment, broad educational groups. Each of these explained a few percentage of change. So when you add it all together, this simple analysis of four economic factors can account for over 60% of the overall decline in marriage. Of course, there's all kinds of structural factors it doesn't take into account. For example, we know that job insecurity has been increasing, but we don't have any way to capture that. We've got information about current income and occupation, but nothing about perceived future prospects for workers, which must be less bright than they were 40 years ago. IPMs can't tell us if young people are optimistic about their prospects or if their jobs are insecure. So the real impact of declining economic opportunity is probably even bigger. So Easterlin was broadly right about relative income. The decline in marriage since 1960 can mostly be explained by the deteriorating circumstances of young men compared with the previous generation. But why did relative income decline so much? Easterlin argued that the decline in relative wages for young men resulted from generational competition. Here's the key graph from his 1978 PAA presidential address. It shows the men aged 15 to 29 as a percentage of men aged 30 to 64. Easterlin argued that young men's prospects depended above all on how many of them there were competing for those jobs. So the huge boom in relative income after the war occurred because young men were in short supply. But as the baby boomers came of age, the number of young men entering the labor force exploded. The oil crisis hit in 1973, precipitating a long and severe recession with the unprecedented abundance of workers in the face of declining demand for labor, the golden age of post-war wage labor came to a screeching halt. Easterlin's 1978 presidential address came just after the peak of his graph, and he could see that generational competition was going to drop just as fast as it has risen. So he predicted that a second golden age for young men's employment was just around the corner. By 1984, he argued, wages would be up, relative income would recover, and there would be new, a new marriage boom and a new baby boom. Well, it was a good theory, <laughs> but it didn't happen. Despite the smaller cohorts entering the job market after 1978, men's wages continued to decline dramatically. One factor was the mass entry of married women into the labor force, which was partly a response to the decline of, of young men's wage labor, but it partly compensated for the smaller size of the new cohorts. Political change also affected youth opportunities. Reagan was elected in 1980. The country shifted to the right. The fading of labor unions, the decline in the minimum wage, and globalization all contributed to the dramatic decline of wage rates for young men entering the labor force and the long stagnation of wage rates for young women. But I'm convinced that the most important factor, especially after 2000, is the mechanization of production made possible by new technologies, especially advances in computing and sensors. This graph shows trend in US labor productivity over the past 125 years. It suggests that the average worker today produces about 14 times as much as the average worker 125 years ago. The near linear trend on a log scale shows that the percentage growth in productivity has been remarkably steady for a very long period of time. Growth has averaged about 2%. Productivity has been doubling about every 35 years. Some decades have a little faster growth than others, but the overall trend is incredibly consistent over the past century, especially over the last three decades. So if productivity isn't rising 
any faster now than it has for the last 125 years, why does it pose a particular threat to jobs now? Well, here I've plotted an index of the number of jobs against the index of productivity. In, in the early 20th century, jobs grew a lot faster than productivity. The 1929 crash caused a big set setback for job growth, but from 1933 to 1950, job growth kept pace with productivity growth. But then the two series diverge. In the second half of the 20th century, job growth, productivity continued to surge, but job growth slowed. And after 2000, the number of jobs virtually ceased to grow. Well, I think this makes sense. In the early 20th century, jobs grew faster than productivity because new technologies were creating more jobs than they destroyed. When Henry Ford introduced the moving automobile assembly line in 1914, it immediately doubled productivity. The assembly line threw a few carriage makers out of work as people shifted to cars, but it created a lot more jobs than it destroyed. With car prices declining steadily, sales exploded. So employment at Ford went from 2,000 jobs in 1909 to 16,000 in 1914 to 100,000 in 1926. And there were thousands of new jobs in automobile sales, repairs, gas stations. So this is a perfect example of creative destruction, the kind of productivity improvement that creates more jobs than it destroys. But there just aren't that many examples of that in recent years. Mechanization is no longer creating more jobs than it destroys. Cars are being mostly made by robots. This doesn't create a lot of more jobs. The robots are being made by robots too. <laughs> In the mature economies of the de developed world, mechanization seldom stimulates new jobs. There just isn't a lot of room to expand sales. So mechanization increases profitability, but it reduces the demand for labor, especially unskilled labor. The price of robots is declining by 30% a year. Every year they get better. The world's computing capacity is doubling every 24 months. Because of innovations in artificial intelligence and sensing technology, robot capabilities are improving rapidly. They're becoming flexible, more flexible, easier to train. Soon there's going to be very little need for human labor in manufacturing. The rise of intelligent machines is also rapidly eliminating service jobs. Travel agents, parking lot attendants, checkout clerks are being replaced by machines. With the ad rapid advance of artificial intelligence and sensing devices, the potential for automation of services is expanding every year. Transportation is next on the chopping block of automation. In the next couple of decades, driving will be automated. This will be eliminate uh, at least 7 million well-paid working class jobs from taxis to truck drivers, about 5% of the nation's workforce. Fry and Osborne recently estimated that about half the US workforce is employed at jobs that are at high risk of automation within the next decade or two. Another fifth have a moderate risk of automation. They judge that only about a third of jobs are reasonably safe. Well, we've seen something like this happen before. 200 years ago, the great majority of the American population was engaged in agriculture. Today, fewer than 1% of the adult population produces more than enough food to feed everybody else. So it looks like a similar shift is now taking place in manufacturing and services. In the future, just a few percent of the population may be sufficient to produce all the goods and services that the rest of the population needs. Here's a graph of the percentage of men aged 18 to 64 employed in wage and salary jobs since 1800. It went up for 170 years from 13% in 1800 to 75% in 1970. But for the last four decades, the percentage has declined. It now stands at 64%. This decline is unprecedented. Suppose the current trends were to continue. This is just an extrapolation of the trends for the last four decades. I don't see any clear reason to think that this 
long-standing decade of four decades is going to reverse anytime soon. If the decline of male wage employment doesn't continue at the same pace over the next four decades as it did over the past four decades, only about half of working age men will have a wage or salary job by 2055. Among women, wage labor peaked in 2000 and the decline has been slower so far. Because the decline is slower for women, it certainly looks like female wage and salary employment will exceed that of men within a few years. This may be because a lot of the young women entering labor force are increasingly better educated than men. But in the long run, if the jobs disappear, it's bound to affect women as well as men, and their employment would probably follow the same trajectory. Now, Easterlin demonstrated the risks of making short-run predictions in a PAA presidential address. <laughs> I don't see a lot of downside to making a long-run prediction, so I boldly predict that by 2055, the year I turn 100, fewer than half of working age Americans will hold private sector wage and salary jobs. So, what does all this mean for the family? For thousands of years, the corporate family provided the means of subsistence for most people. Then for a little over 100 years, wage labor opportunities grew rapidly, first among men, then among women. These tectonic shifts in the structure of the economy since the mid-19th century transformed the family. The transition from corporate families to male breadwinner families was a consequence of the rise of male wage labor in the Industrial Revolution. The transition from male breadwinner families to dual earner families reflects the massive increase in wage labor among married women following the Second World War. The decline of the corporate family led to a profound shift in generational relations as family patriarchs lost control over their wage earning sons. And then the decline of the male breadwinner family led to an equally profound shift in gender relations as men lost control over their wage earning wives and daughters. The two great shifts in family systems undermined the logic of patriarchal authority. The dramatic retreat from marriage over the past half century could never have occurred without that loss of patriarchal control and the shift in attitudes that accompanied it. But the proximate cause for the retreat from marriage since 1975 is a different structural change. It's the massive decline in relative earnings of young men, the long stagnation in earnings of young women, and declining wage labor participation. With growing inequality, families are facing diverging destinies. Young people with resources are continuing to form families. Among the college educated with good jobs, the impact of family change is muted. Marriage is still feasible. Marital instability is stable or declining. And cohabitation and unmarried fertility can be managed without hardship. But for much of the population, the outlook is grim. Almost a fifth of young adults are in poverty, about double the percentage in 1975. More than 10% of young male wage earners are having their wages garnished because of debt. Many who have jobs are underemployed, taking unskilled and part-time jobs, even if they have good qualifications, and there has been a dramatic decline in intergenerational mobility. Among young people who lack resources, families are difficult to sustain. Fewer and fewer are marrying. Those who do are at increasing risk of divorce. For people without decent, stable jobs, cohabiting unions are increasingly unstable, and most infants reside with a single parent. If we allow the market to eliminate most jobs without any intervention, the outcome could be truly dystopian. Inequality could rise to unprecedented levels. Most people would be jobless and poor. Without buyers, there would be little incentive to produce goods and services, however cheaply it can be done. 
the economy would deteriorate, there would be massive social upheaval. But it doesn't have to be that way. If I'm right that the era of ever-expanding wage labor is drawing to a close because of computer-enabled mechanization, that is not a calamity. On the contrary, it's a wonderful thing. For the last 10,000 years, most of humanity has been forced to work long hours and repetitive and backbreaking toil just to earn basic subsistence. We're on the verge of being able to make everything we need, including all kinds of things unimagined by previous generations without that kind of tedious and grueling drudgery, with hardly any work at all. Our silicon servants will have the potential to provide everyone with food, shelter, and all other necessities, freeing us to pursue our dreams and passions. But before we can realize this utopian vision, we have to figure out how to share the bounty of the machines. The biggest challenge isn't how to produce wealth, but how to distribute it, how to get money into the hands of people, especially young people, so they can buy all those goods and services that the robots can produce with such little effort. So we can choose a better future. We just need to guarantee employment at a living wage to everyone who seeks it. We've tried this strategy before. The Works Projects Administration of the 1930s paid people to do all kinds of useful things. The greatest legacy of the WPA may be the artistic projects, including the Federal Writers Projects, the various fine arts projects, a whole range of historic preservation projects. My presentation today would have been impossible if it weren't for the WPA project that microfilmed and preserved all the historical US census manuscripts. If we can solve the problem of providing everyone with economic security, then families will take care of themselves. Today's families are far more humane and egalitarian than anything that came before. There's universal social condemnation of corporal punishment of wives. Wife beating is illegal. Child beating is still legal in the United States, but as the Minnesota Viking Adrian Peterson discovered, even in the state of Texas, you can get in trouble for beating your child severely. Women are no longer legally subordinate to their husbands. Wives can work for wages. They can keep their earnings. They no longer need their husband's permission to open a checking account or sign a contract. There's growing tolerance of new family forms to the point where gay marriage is now legal in 37 states. Time use data show that families are becoming more and more egalitarian with respect to house care, housework and child care. So we shouldn't mourn the demise of the authoritarian corporate and male breadwinner families. They're gone and that has made the world a better place. But if we can assure, ensure that everyone has something to do and makes a living wage, that will surely make families stronger. In 1930, John Maynard Keynes wrote an essay on the economic possibilities for our grandchildren. He predicted that a combination of technological innovation and capital accumulation will eventually solve the problem of material needs. He said, I draw the conclusion that the economic problem may be solved or at least within sight of a solution within 100 years. Well, it's 85 years after this prediction and I think that we are already within sight of solving the economic problem. Keynes concluded, for the first time, humanity will be faced with our real, our permanent problem, how to use our freedom from pressing economic cares, how to occupy the leisure which science and compound interest will have won for us to live wisely and agreeably and well. Thank you. <laughs>